I'm Ria Wolgar. I am the teacher librarian at Shaz T Secondary in Prince George, um, BC. We're way up north and we have some pretty tight COVID restrictions right now because um, we need them. So it's a bit lonely out here these days. Um, I've been in the library. This is my 11th or 12th year and I love it. I think it's just such a great position to be in. You get to work with the staff, you get to work with the students. Um, I think it's a position where you get to be really creative and you get to draw on a whole bunch of different skills. Um, so I'm almost never bored every now and then, a little bit bored. Um, but we are in this situation um, out north here where we don't have enough teachers teaching on call. So um, I'm often not as badly this year, but I'm often a teacher on call in addition to being a teacher librarian. That's sort of my situation. And I'm Emily Huang, and um, I work in Langley, and they're just kind of stuck with me there now. <laughs> I really love the library. Um, I taught for eight years in a classroom, of well, nine actually, and um, I just find that I can be more creative and I can I just really like the networking aspect, the collaborating with the staff. And I feel that that's where my skill set is better used than in the classroom. Um, but I, I do miss it every once in a while. Yeah. Um, yes, and I'm in elementary. Awesome. All right. Looks like we have a couple of people doing the library diploma as well. Those of you that are doing it, are you doing it at UBC, U of A? Um, Means. UBC. Queens, cool. Yeah. Very cool. All right, Ria. All right, can I read this and have all the stuff on my screen that's here? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. All right. I love this quote. This is one of my guiding quotes for what I do when I'm working in the library. Um, it says, our library should transition to places to do stuff, not simply places to get stuff. Um, I don't know if any of you have read um, the Valencia, Joyce Valenza stuff where she talks about, you know, we need to be the kitchen. And she's like, the library will become a laboratory in which the community members tinker, build, learn, and communicate. We need to stop being the grocery store, candy store, and become the kitchen. And I try and always think of that in my head. Um, you know, we're the kitchen, people come in, they do the tinkering, they do the making, and they do it in a place that feels like home. You know, when you have a party, everybody ends up in the kitchen. And when you're doing good learning, I love to think that everybody ends up in the library. Um, so we should emphasize hospitality, comfort, convenience, and create work environments that invite exploration and creativity, both virtually and physically. And I think for myself, that quote is just when I'm having the days where I'm like, what am I doing? That is my guide and quote. Um, oh, look it, we're we're on to we're already getting into like the super tips already. And we're, um, we're really hoping that you can. I know, well, at least for myself, for Pro D, if I can walk away with two things for the whole day that I know that I can start to do right away, we're hoping that we'll give you at least one because I know the keynote just blew my mind. <laughs> so here we go. We're gonna just get through these things because um, there's a lot. <laughs> there are a lot. So we are just jumping right in. So this is like a little one minute trick. It'll cost you 15 bucks. Um, what I have done for secondary is we have this keypad um, that's up here. And when students are doing sign outs, um, my clerk tends to be the one that does the sign outs. Um, I do a few of them, but we try and um, I try and do as much teaching as I possibly can. So this speeds up our sign out. So I'm not taking time. Um, and you just start like enter your number, the kids punch in their number and it's really swift. Um, so that's a, that's a quick, quick tip. Oh, and this is weeding. Again, we're just jumping all over because we're just giving a bunch of different tips and tricks. I find I've just moved into a brand new school. Um, we moved in last year, beautiful new school. My library is about 60% the size that it used to be. So I had to do a lot of weeding and people would get really freaked out when I would do weeding. Um, so I started to use the milk analogy that Gail Dickinson does. Um, when you're saying like, do you keep it because you 
don't want to go to the store to buy more or you don't have money to go to the store to buy more? Um, do you keep it because your refrigerator would look empty? And I've started throwing those questions back when people are like, oh my goodness, you're getting rid of so many books. Um, why would you send outdated encyclopedias or other materials to a teacher for classroom use? Um, true story, when I took over in this building, I had a complete set of the Lumberjack's Guide to Contact Dermatitis, um, essentially rashes you get from in the woods. Um, and nobody had bothered to weed that out because they were like, um, we spent a lot of money on it. So I had these brand new books that had never been used. Um, and then the other thing I say is when people are like, oh, where do you send this? Like, would you send outdated resources to be used by children in this or other countries? And we just kind of look at how it's respectful to not do things like that. And by having a very, very well-weeded library, you start to really use the things that are in it. Um, you'll f I, I hope you'll, you can go to your, um, your teacher library and associations in your district, they should have a weeding guideline for you. If you don't, if they don't, you can always contact me and my contact information are probably all over the place. Um, I, Langley has a really strong one for, for weeding and, um, and well, I could share that with you. Um, you, sh you should also go and talk to your principal if you're brand new, um, trying to find what the guidelines are and what your budgets are. That's who you should go to. And hopefully your teacher librarian association will also have something for book challenges, not the challenges that um, Marilyn and Keely and uh, Devika was talking about, but ones where the parents come in and they're upset about a book. So it's good to know what your whole district does so that you can have the forms sitting. I, I don't use them often, but I do have them on a clipboard by my desk and I could just take off the form, hand it to the parent. And I know what's going to happen because we've decided on it as a whole district. So those are good things to be looking for. Um, for me, um, we I have paint stir sticks that I uh, spray paint in each Division is a different color, and then the students' labels are on one end um, for the barcode, and then they can use them as not only the barcode when they come to get scanned, but they are really great because they're sturdy because they're made out of wood um, between okay. books on the shelves so that they can find where they took the book out if they don't like it. Um, and also, I've now started with the little ones. Um, they get really upset if they forgot their book. So now if they've forgotten their book, I take the stir stick, put it inside the book, close the book, put it in a hold section. And now it's waiting for the next mm -hmm. time they come. And they feel much better knowing that even though they didn't get the book that day, that it's still waiting for them. And if they bring it the next day, I just grab it out of the, the pile and then off we go. So those paint sticks and they'll give you, if you go in and say what it's for, Rona and Home Depot are really awesome about it. And then it's in Pringle containers, which is really nice for stacking. <laughs> so it's just an e easy idea that I've come up Can with. I add as well quickly, um, one of the things I found was kids would read books off my shelves and then they would like put them in, like return them to spots they don't really belong. So I started, I just got, went to the dollar store, got some little bins and it says return books here, you know, don't reshelf. And that has meant number one, we can mark them as used. So we know sometimes that kids aren't signing out books, but they're using them repeatedly. And number two, we just, don't have books being hidden in weird spots on the shelves. So there's an example of um, where I all the books that are waiting for kids. And then not, not with COVID, but pre-COVID, um, we were putting on little bracelets when they forgot their books. And then they went home. It's just uh, get a, like a like hundred on Amazon for a very cheap price. And it's just like the ones that you go in the water with when you go to the um, the water slides. And then that when they got home, they're like, parents are like, oh no, you got the bracelet. All right, let's get that book into your backpack. And it was, the kids like the bracelets. And sometimes they even ask for them when they brought their books back, but uh, it, it worked out well. And then for my little guys, if, you, if you're new to uh, elementary TL, it's really nice to have the really big freezer bags to put the books in because kindergarten, at least kindergarten to grade one, things get wet. Uh, there's stuff that goes into the backpacks that's just not good for books. Um, and then it, it also helps the parents. And they've told me that year after year, if their label is um, on the front and it says it's for the library, then they know that whatever books in there needs to come back the next week. So it's not, mm -hmm. even though it has a barcode on it, it's very clearly the library book in their plastic bag. 
And then I have students in the lower grades bring me back the books in their bins. So I just got bins from Walmart, put their, te- their name on it, and it's in each classroom. And that's where they put them so that I can pick them up at the beginning of the day and then have them all scanned in before they come. Because I know um, if you're having kids bring them in as they're walking in, it can be very overwhelming. So if you have time at the beginning of the day, it's a great way to have all those books to come and get them checked in. All right. Um, This is just about getting technology. Um, Emily's got some great tricks that work for her district, not for ours because of some purchasing rules, but just getting access to technology so that people have their hands on it and can be using it. Um, I have a lab in the library and it's great. I can have a class in there, but having, um, having more computers that kids are able to just use very casually in and out has been really useful. And I've kind of chipped and chipped and chipped away at getting getting them. So now we're at 38 desktops. This is a picture of my old library um, because I just didn't manage to get a couple of new pictures in. Um, and we have 32 laptops. It makes such a big difference um, having the technology. Uh, we, we have iPads in our district. We have... Um, the schools can get their own, but uh, the district gave us a few per classroom. So we do use those. Um, laptops were very hard to come by. So I put up a, um, an e, a website for you, Reuse Tech BC. They take um, fairly new laptops and they refurbish them so that they can give them out to schools for like almost nothing. So we're, look, we're talking like I got one for $12 that had been used by a company that just had upgraded their own. So it's a great place to look if you're trying to get ones for your library and your school just does not have a budget. Um, they usually though do not have great batteries. So it's not one that you can like take and go somewhere and work on it. You're going to need to be plugged in. That's one of the reasons why they, they get the laptops that they get, but mine have been working really well. Um, I don't have a lot for coding, but I do have blue bots, which are one of the ones that I really enjoy um, using uh, for coding. Uh, for the collection, I have up here that I have chosen to genreify my library in the fiction section. Um, I know for queens, it's like one of the things that you talk about, which is fantastic. Um, And genrefying just mean that instead of having it all by author alphabetically through my um, probably like I would consider it like my grade three to five novels, we've done it as if you were to go into chapters. So you have like animals together and then you have uh, fantasy and so on. Um, My students really, really enjoy it. It was a huge process. It took a long time, but I have a technician and we just slowly worked section by section, just pulling books out of the shelf that we all thought were fantasy, did those first. And then a month later, we tried again. And the kids got really excited as we were doing it. They find them much easier. And I know people think they pigeonhole, but only a few, a lot of them will look like, oh, what's next to the mythology section? Oh, look, mystery. I'll try mystery. Um, I find that a lot that they just at least gives them a spot that they can go to without feeling overwhelmed by just alpha and alphabet in front of them. Um, And then I personally have put my graphic novels and my manga in the different genres because I tell them that graphic novel, you can get in realistic fiction, you can get in mystery, and it makes them look more and try different things more is what I've been finding. Can I comment on that too? Um, I genrefied my very first year. Um, I was, you know, fresh out of U of A and it sounded like such a good idea. So we did it and it was a huge undertaking. And our circulation stats went up by about 35% that first year um, because students would find their spot. Um, They often don't know the author that they're looking for. So they would find their spot in the library. And then like Emily said, you know, they would go and they would do the adventure books and then they'd be like, oh, well, I just noticed that mystery, like kids will be like, mystery's like adventure. I'm like, sure, of course it is. Um, you know, they're like science fictions, like fantasy, and they draw their own conclusions and and start to branch out. So I, I think like personally for myself, I don't know if I could ever go back to not being genrefied at this point. Yours looks so pretty, Emily. I can <laughs> look like such. Yay, a- my technician, she's amazing. I had to take them all off because it was my idea to do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, just so you know, we just found out um, there's a lot of things you can take off the stickers. Some are great, some are not. 
We just found out two days ago that WD-40 is amazing for the very old stickers that have that silver background backing on it that are just mm -hmm. awful. Just keep putting a little bit of that on it and it comes right off. It's amazing. So that's my new tip for the week. <laughs> All right, this is just um, a tip. Again, this is my old space because um, we're somewhat cohorted still and we're not um, meeting in larger spaces and larger groups. Um, my, my big tip is just don't get, don't get stuck or sold on a table arrangement. Um, be, be willing to move things out. So the big circle you can see there is Phyllis Webstad came and she had two classes and she, she's um, the orange shirt lady and she did um, a reconciliation circle with two classes that we had in. Um, but then, you know, on the left hand side or whatever side it shows up for you guys on the screen, there's a day where, you know, we pushed tables together and they were, um, these guys were planning, um, they were doing like an industrial revolution and how, how machines had changed. So they were planning machines. And then the next day they set up these building stations. So I get used to kind of bruised legs because my tables are in different spots and I walk into them all the time. Um, but like, let yourself kind of just break things up and, and open and have different, different flexible spaces. I'm big on wheels. <laughs> I like things that roll. Um, so we, we found tables, a marketplace and got them to roll. Um, and then I put in a link for um, evergreen office supplies. If you're in the lower mainland, um, Brent is amazing and he will find you things if your district will allow you to do that. Or if your principal allows you to do naughty things like me uh, <laughs> to save some money. Um, a lot of my bookshelves are, are rolling. Um, my students are totally used to walking in and like there'll be tarps on the ground because I can move everything out of the mm -hmm. way. Okay. So for decorating, if you're in the keynote, <laughs> I do go a little crazy, but it's honestly laziness. Um, for me personally, when I first started to be a TL, changing the displays constantly was so overwhelming. Like it was like, I didn't know what holiday I should be doing. I didn't know. And I didn't have the time to put up something new. And I realized the book had been sitting there for three months. So what I do is I actually do year long themes. So I just decorate at the end of the summer really big. And then in the hallway, I'll do a little display when I feel like it and I have time. So this is not for everyone, but it's something that I found that saved me so much time after school that I can actually see my family. So this year for 2021, uh, it is Middle Earth. <laughs> my husband desperately needed something. He works with me at the school, needed something to do with fish. So I had to pick a theme. Normally I pick my own themes. So I was like, hey, there's a river and a lake in The Hobbit. I can do Middle Earth. So this is just an example of how I just kind of decorate the, the library. And the students are hilarious if there's like the second time they've been in our school. Because next year they're like, wait a minute, why isn't it Alice in Wonderland in here? And they didn't realize that it changes yearly. <laughs> All right. Um, this is sort of a, a little couple pictures that talk about my makerspace stuff. We have a very high tech makerspace lab in our school. Um, and for me to try and match anything that they're doing would just be silly. Um, so like, there's no way that, you know, they've got the laser cutter, they've got the 3D printer, they have all of that stuff. So what we've done is we have the lower tech makerspace stuff in the classroom or in the library. And right now we use it for not as much because of COVID again, but we're using it for sort of mental health. Um, we use it um, like the Lego. We sometimes do these challenges where kids have to like make a scene from a story that they've, they've read and somebody has to figure out which scene from the short story. Um, I have to admit though, right now, like it feels like we haven't got to use it very much in the last two years and it's a little bit dreary. We also have our games and same, same story with that just because when they're playing games, you know, kids are sitting at these little tables. And as you can see in the picture there, they're very close to each other. Um, yes, have a no glitter policy. I messed up on that and I had carpet. Thankfully that building's been knocked down and leveled. Um, yeah, have a no glitter policy, like firm no glitter policy. I had green glitter that was everywhere for about two and a half years. Um, 
And then I have the students do the heavy lifting when it comes to organization. I have a few students that um, want to be library helpers, and we don't have them because of the QP position doing shelving or anything like that, but they help me with keeping the makerspace stuff organized. They also go through the games and make sure that we have all of our pieces. And they just, they've really taken that on. In fact, in the last couple of years, I haven't had to do much other than, you know, helping to wipe some tables on occasion. Um, thinking pre-COVID, I did, I was big into puzzles. And um, if when COVID is over, hopefully soon, uh, one great way of keeping a puzzle together is actually to take a really cheap whiteboard from the dollar store um, or staples and then have them do it on top of that because the edges of the whiteboard will keep it from falling out. And you can see it very clearly on the white. So it's a very cheap way of being able to do a puzzle without all the pieces falling apart each time someone tries to do something. And I used that, that shelf, from you. <laughs> and that shelf is my mess of a makerspace. I just put it in as an example that you don't have to have a beautiful room or <laughs> nice cupboards to have a makerspace. I like to have things in clear um, containers. And then we just have all kinds of things that kids know they can go over and pull it out and then play with it. And um, very simple things, just like even for the young ones, just blocks and marbles. They will go forever. Throw in some cars and you're good for about a half an hour. I just saw something at Walmart. I bought it yesterday for my son and it's um, it was $30 and it's 186 pieces. And essentially it's like one of those um, rube, I'm blanking on the term, like where you get a marble to go from one spot to another using gravity and switches and all sorts of different marble things. Marble runs. Thank marble you. Runs. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fancy term for it, but I'm not fancy. And it was $30 and I bought it and I was going to give it to my son for his birthday in December. And I ended up opening it yesterday because it looked so cool. And now I'm planning to go back after work today and buy one for my library because um, I just think that it's one of those things that will keep kids super, super entertained, but also thinking critically. Um, I'll take a picture and I'll pop it into our slides, which they'll be available for people, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I will take a picture and I'll pop it into our slides. Um, just because I saw I had a teacher come in yesterday and just reminding you, and if, if your school allows it or in your district allows it, don't forget about places like Value Village and, and on Facebook on Marketplace. Um, finding things used is huge. And if you're, even if like somehow you can use your budget for something else in the school and then they give you money for something if you can get it used, it's so much, it's so much cheaper and it's quite, and you'll, you'll be surprised what's out there. A lot of my stuff is from marketplace um, mm -hmm. or Valley village. Um, I just threw up there uh, Kiva blocks are huge. Uh, K E V A. If I was going to buy anything as a first year TL for making, it would be the Kiva blocks. They're all blocks that are about the same. They are the same width and height and exact same block. And you can make a million things. And if you go online onto YouTube, they actually have tutorials that'll show you how to make ball runs and make bridges and all kinds of things, but you can use them for everything. So that would be my, that's what I would put my money in if I was a brand new TL. And then um, big into Lego, kind of like Rhea. So we took an old rolling uh, shelf and then actually made it into a Lego wall so that it wasn't just stuck in one place. So now I can actually roll it down the hallway to someone's classroom if there's a sub and they don't know what they're going to do at lunchtime. Um, and then some, and once in the library, we can do themes. We have been using it, but we do it by divisions since COVID started. So like each week, one division will do something really neat. As you can see, um, there's one about food and the grade ones were doing food last year. It was pretty cute. And then we had one about dinosaurs and apparently they go on skateboards. <laughs> so Lego and, and not having it on the wall was huge for me because it allows you to do it anywhere, being flexible mm -hmm. in your space. Um, this is again, I feel like many of the things that we've done um, this in the past have been really hard to keep going with COVID. We did breakout rooms um, and I I bought into breakout EDU and we got the very first, like um, you can see the box. Um, well, you can see the toolkit on there. And I ended up saying, well, we could do this ourselves. So we hacked it and we just went to Walmart. We went to a few places and now we have six of those toolboxes where we can do breakouts with students. I had used the breakout EDU subscription 
Um, it's quite pricey. It's got more pricey in the last, like the very first year we did it, I think it was $49. And I don't remember what it is now because it's just too pricey for me. But they've sort of taken off and there's a lot that you can do on that come off of Pinterest. And even um, there's some on Teachers Pay Teachers, although I just really try to not spend, I don't know, after 20 years of spending my own money on things, I'm really trying to, to, to get things free at this point. Um, so breakouts have been fantastic. Again, because of COVID, you've got kids that are really close or, you know, they're in each other's faces and it's a little bit difficult, but highly recommend them. There's a few that are out there that are free that are on library skills, and those have been excellent for orientation for our grade eights. Oh, our games again. Um, our games are so much fun. Probably one of the things that we've done that's become sort of a tradition here now at our school is we have our grade eights. We feel like they need to learn to take turns. We feel like they need to learn how to follow rules. Um, maybe your students are in the same boat. Maybe it's just our little postal code out here. Um, but what we found is that they, there's not a lot of kids that are used to sitting around a table and conversing with each other, following rules, doing things like that. So we purchased a class set of Settlers of Catan. We have an all year humanities class and we teach them the game we're going to start next week will be the first round through and we just teach them the game um, after we've taught them the game and they've learned how to play a little then we frame it with the question what factors influence the rise of civilization which is all of what sort of grade eight humanities is about and then when we get to the very end of the year sort of may june what we do is um, there's the probability in the game where there's the probability that you get in a small group um, you know where you're if you've ever played a game and you know somebody keeps rolling an 11, even though statistically that's not the way the game is supposed to go. Um, so we have the kids compare one, one game versus all of the games together to see how that actually matches the statistics. And then we use settlers for introducing a gaming unit that we do with our grade eights. So it's just become this thing that ties things together. Not surprisingly, um, I don't know if you can see on there, we have a few um, boxes of the game pandemic that has not been a real hit this year. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm gonna jump back to sort of like the collection stuff. I don't know if any other high school people have found this. Um, my students used to be really into sci-fi. They really liked um, sort of like the dystopian stuff. And we hit COVID and they went from dystopian sci-fi to romance, a lot of romance and horror, like the over the top, you know, the Stephen King kind of stuff because they were just not in for dystopia. So I'm learning still to respond to what it is that they're needing. Oh, this is about projects. This is um, this is probably for me my favorite part of the position is when a teacher comes and says, "I want to teach this, and I don't want to just I don't want to just stand at the front and give notes. How can I teach this in a way that will make it real for students and where their research is is real?" And so I always try and frame when I'm working with teachers things into a big question so that students learn later to answer their own big questions. And then we support the research through that. Um, so these are some that we did last year. Um, right now I'm working on one with students. Um, they're looking at how us relying on staple crops is becoming a bit of an agricultural issue. So they're looking at what would happen if more of us were to choose to eat, eat ancient grains and the problems that go with that. Um, and it's really interesting because kids will be like, did you know that quinoa is a really big deal in Peru? And they're finding this cool stuff and they're getting more excited about it than being like, hey, quinoa is a grain that has more protein than wheat. Um, oh, can you click on this link for me, Emily? Will that work? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I really hope this works. Um, we have had tons and tons of absences. Kids miss a day because, well, right now we're finding if kids miss one day, they're missing five to 14 days. Um, a lot of 14 days right now. Um, so some of the teachers were saying like, how can I make it so the kids are learning what they need to learn? And I'm not going 
crazy prepping things and doing things. So we discovered um, we've been using Canva for things and we've been teaching our students via Instagram um, some of the things that they need. So if they miss a foods lab, um, we found ways to do foods labs and put them on Instagram. So this is just like this would show up in an Instagram story or the kids could have the link and it just gives them all of the information that they need. Um, and so this is one the foods teacher and I did on making sourdough. I went into her classroom and we do this thing on microorganisms and I had made cheese with her classroom. So we have one on how to make cheese. Um, and we've tried to do things that students could do at home rather easily, like much more easily than, you know, a super involved um, lab. But we're finding that it's a great way to just feed, like feed what kids need to know in terms of information. And they're really quick and easy. You just drag and drop your pictures in, add some words, and you're good to go. Okay, now we're going to have a problem because uh -oh. I get to my screen. Try just hitting escape. Okay. Nope. Nope. Okay. Hmm. We'll be able to get to. Let's do this. Aha. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm not the most technological advanced person ever. <laughs> okay, so we should be good. I'm just giving up on tech today. Uh -huh. No, I did it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, just, this yeah, is... one second. We. I'm conscious of the time. We do have about nine minutes before. We should probably see if anyone has questions. Mm -hmm. I know we're throwing so much at you because um, it is only a 45 minute thing. So we will probably speed it up in the next nine minutes. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ria. Um, yeah, so feel free to drop questions into the chat. One of the things that I have super duper enjoyed is having two classes of students come in, sometimes the same grade, sometimes not, and having them work through things together. Um, I've worked with one of my teachers on a project where she brings in her grade eights and another teacher brings in their grade 11s and the grade 11s work on teaching the grade eights some math concepts. Um, and it just gets kind of a deeper learning for everybody. But it, what we're finding is the feedback that we're getting from the grade 11s is, oh, I didn't know that when I was in grade eight, and now I wish I'd known it. Um, so they're teaching some of the things that kids, like students need to know, and they're doing it in a way that's become really fluid, um, really helpful. Again, it's something that we can't, well, right now we're sort of trying COVID wrecks stuff. I mean, not that you need us to tell you that. Um, this is just, if you're looking for something to do in secondary and you want a collaboration, this is one that is one of my absolute favorites. Um, my foods teacher and myself, she collaborates just brilliantly. Um, so she was just like, I want to do this international foods course, which she's now offered five or six times um, and we make this great big wheel that goes on the wall in her classroom and kids learn about flavor profiles of different countries they do all this different country research um, but then at the very i was it two-thirds of the way through the course the kids take on a a country they research it they make food from that country but they turn it into little like sort of tapas or appetizers and we actually have like a tasting had a tasting kind of time and people would feed each other and classes would come in and be like oh this flavor profile like grease is different from here because of this and again like the research piece in the library but even going to the eating piece in the library was really cool and me if you don't mind checking the chat as we go on. yes i don't see anything okay perfect um for the elementary um um, if we switch, switch gears and kind of when you have prep time that you have to cover <laughs> and you have classes come in, a nice way of getting uh, the teaching about taking care of your books and things like that. Um, I do Dr. Evil, so I have a lab coat and I put a wig on and then each time Dr. Evil comes, there is something wrong with the book that 
they took out from the library. So um, it's always going to be like your discarded books, but still like there's water damage in one, there's food in another, the next time it comes, like he's always so happy that he did great before. And then the next thing happens, they've ripped pages. Um, I started already with my uh, kindergartens and it's just a nice way of kind of removing it that you do this all the time to oh, look, an adult has this happen, but what can we do instead? Washing our hands, turning the page from the top and things like that. Um, so dressing up and having those kind of, they don't believe it's me and that is okay. We turn on our imagination by pressing buttons on our heads, and but they end up loving it by the end, even though they do know it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, um, a question that came up and I missed it in the chat was um, in high school libraries, are people separating the graphic novels and manga into genres? Um, and I have not, um, I, I need to maybe question why I haven't. I think way back when I did it, it just seemed overwhelming. Um, I have a, a group of students that use the mangas like very heavily. Um, I, I'm going to look into it. If anybody has, if anybody's done it, put in the chat, like how that's worked for you. I do know if I, if I can find them at Valley Village, a second copy I have for, especially in the manga, putting a kind of small section. Um, but I do first put the first copy in with the rest of them so that those are the ones that students have to ask usually, but then they start realizing that there's more around it or they know what's going on in that series. And I still like them in the shelves with the other books, but um, I, I would love to know what other people are doing in secondary too. Mm -hmm. um, this is just that you can do digital leader leadership. So um, my grade fours and fives, not since COVID though, unfortunately, um, but we're starting it up this year. They have their own, um, Twitter handle, and they've been posting uh, things that they feel that they're proud of and things that are going on at school. So that's a, a easy way of just getting a little bit of digital leadership going on. A nice thing to do during your preps with the kids if you have the older students so they can get them into small groups. And then one group just goes off and then videotapes something going on in the hallway or takes pictures and then they can upload it. And then I always just quickly look it over with them before that they actually submit it. News. Uh, Lego clubs, we've talked a lot about those, but that's a, another fun one that you can do. Um, I have sometimes parent helpers, not right now, but they can come in. And then sometimes the older students too. Um, this is just something that I started doing my first year to support my teachers with their reading, because I noticed that when our teachers read our students read. Um, so one of our teachers, um, Mr. Cook there, he's a PE teacher and people just adore him to bits. And when he's reading a book, the kids are like, oh, well, what's he reading? Or if um, our teachers and our staff have like, you know, Mr. So-and-so recommends, and I just slap that sticker on the books when they're on display, um, especially like we know that kids connect with us and we know that they, you know, they tend to like us. I mean, unless they don't, um, you know, some kid likes you, some kid likes every teacher. Right. Um, and so they'll be like, Oh, Mr. Cook read that Mr. So-and-so read that. And they'll read a book because a teacher has recommended it. So that's one of the little sort of services that I've done for my staff is a book match for them a couple times a year, usually spring break and Christmas. Um, <laughs> this is, we're a bit goofy. So we had like, um, I try to be the hub and have snacks and, you know, different things like that when we can. Again, this is a picture of my old building because cohorts this year have made things difficult. So we had a thing where we had this case of can Fanta that we stacked and did different things with for about a year. Um, nobody drank it, um, but it just became this thing. If there was a meeting in the library, we were Fanta stacking. I don't know how it came to be, um, but when we moved out of the building, we sort of stopped that. And but just having something where kids are like, "Oh, that's the thing that we do in here." Our staff is like, "Oh yeah, I came to stack my Fanta." Um, it's fun. Um, school spirit stuff. Um, I try as much as possible to be a safe for students. Like if I do anything, that's probably the number one thing for me. Um, and I want kids to have a, a spot in the building that they can connect with and feel like it's their space. 
Um, so we have lots of like very family type things. We have seating arrangements that are family style, um, you know, couch style. Um, we we try to provide students with a place where they can check in. If you've ever been to any of Gordon Newfeld's um, sessions where he talks about mental health, he's like, lots of our students don't have an end of day. They don't have a spot in their lives where they can sit down and just kind of sit and review what's gone on in their day. For most of us, we go home from work. You know, we have that time where we maybe sit in our car or we, you know, get our kids to bed and we sit with our tea and we have an end of day and our students don't often have an end of day. So I've been working really hard to provide that sort of situation for my students. And I do that by um, sometimes having tea and things like that, um, but just having an open space that they're comfortable in. We also have like traditions that we do. So we do reindeer games. We have blind date with a book. Um, I take my spare bears on a Slurpee run. We have across the street, there's like a little convenience store where the students meet to spray paint things and sometimes fight, and, um, but they make really good Slurpees. And so I usually take like come May, the kids that are assigned to me for spares, we do like the quick deke across the road and get Slurpees. Um, I hide golden tickets in the books that if they, you know, it's in a book that's never been read or hasn't been read in a long time. And if they find the golden ticket, they can exchange it for like a treat of some sort. Um, I think it's been said lots, especially in uh, the keynote, there's that uh, best thing is to is just get in there into the staff room or wherever the teachers mm -hmm. are and just chat and what are you working on? And are you bored with that? Do you want to try something else? And just keep offering and mm -hmm. uh, because they really want your help because if they could do it themselves, they probably would. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just, we're almost at the end, but I, this is one of my yeah. most favorite ones. I had a teacher that was doing mining and she's like, I've been doing mining for 20 years. I am so bored. So we decided we do space mining. <laughs> so we had the kids, uh, there's the NASA station in the gym. And then we made this massive tunnel with blankets going down the hallway. Um, and then inside the library was taped off uh into to squares in like a grid pattern and we had put objects in it so the people at nasa and the gym would send their astronauts in like the painter's gear um and their ipad down the tube to mars in the library and then they would have to follow their coded grid that the people at nasa had made so left left right left and then when they got to that spot, they would take a picture and then they would go back. And the, there were silly things like ducks and skull heads. But then there was also the rocks that they had been talking about, some of the gear that you would use, um, things that I didn't quite understand because I didn't do the whole unit with the students. But that brought it a full circle. It was fun. The other classes saw something crazy was going on and they couldn't wait to do mining another time, like in the year that they go on to do with that teacher. And it just gave that teacher a, a break and it gave them like something to be excited about and wanting to do it another time. So, but it looks like we have two minutes, Ria. Should and a couple of little questions here. Yeah, um, say, should we go to chat? I'll stop sharing my screen. So yeah. So one of the questions over. is, when do students get to use the maker space um, and Lego wall? Um, I lost track here in the questions. Somebody said first, um, are you saying maker space is okay, but not puzzles during COVID? We've had so many different rules with that in our space. Like we had to have things that could be sprayed with Vanguard. Puzzles would warp when they got sprayed. Um, we finally got to a point where we just kind of shut all of that down because the cleaning was um was a pain um i haven't done them only because we found other things that we've been like we, we focused it more on the lego wall watch which was easier to clean but it wasn't because i didn't want to use the puzzles anymore this year like i feel like right. i totally can um, without any problems. It's just that we, it hasn't come out yet. So. Yeah. And then here's a question. It says, what kind of balance do you propose for makerspace classes versus traditional library lessons reading time? This is from a K-5 to teacher. Uh, what a good so question. Like, it's, for me, it's often integrated. Um, and then if, like a, if it's a 45, um, 
we usually spend, I would say, half doing the traditional reading a story, which, like you said, is integrated right into whatever we're making mm-hmm. afterwards. Or sometimes we'll just do traditional, the whole 45. And then if I'm lucky enough, I might have a collaboration block right after, and then we can slowly move into it. Mm-hmm. And then once in a while, it's literally, there's an extra 10 minutes because the book was way too fast. And now like, hey, can you make um, superhero logos on the Lego wall? And it's a very quick, very directed kind of maker space. Um, but I try really hard not to get rid of some of the traditional because you'd be surprised. They still don't know how to turn that page. They still don't know what the spine is <laughs> in the little ones. Like those things are still really important. Yeah. Two questions here. One from um, elementary teacher at my school. The English teachers are very resistant to new things. Um, you know, I find sometimes we're all resistant to new things. Um, this library has been seen as a book exchange place only. Um, it's this person's first year in the library and they have collab blocks. How do I entice these people to sign up? Um, my emails with lesson ideas have not been met with enthusiasm. My secret when I went in, not even a secret, um, was I found the person who wanted to work with me. And my first year, I probably only worked, we have a staff of 42 full-time equivalents. Um, I worked with three on deeper things um, and not just book exchanges or just the basic, you know, come in and, and research something, come in, leave, or typing, you know, they come in, type with their class. So I just found the people and then they went, oh, other people went, oh, I saw what you did with Mrs. D's class. I was wondering if you could do something similar with mine. What about you, Emily? How do you deal with um, resistance? It was very hard at the beginning. Um... Mine was I went to, well, two things I did. One, I went to the newest teacher <laughs> and I honed in on that one because I knew that that was someone who probably could use a little bit of help and they were they were more willing to try. And the other one was is I picked one person. I literally said, I feel like no one wants to collaborate with me. I would love to do something with one person. Could you trust me just once? What are you doing in your class? They told me what it was. I'm like, I'm going to come up with something fun for just one block and all you have to do is show up. And yes, that took a lot of effort, but once we did that one block, she's like, so what are we doing next week? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, But taking all the planning off their plate to start with, even though it's a lot of work for us is a lot of the ways that you can get an in. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Ria, the next person goes, Hey, Holy cow. What was the tunnel in the hallway? And now they want in because they realize they can do a little less work and it's way more fun to do with another teacher. And I find it's a snowball. So, you know, you add more and you add more, but the work goes in the opposite direction because, you know, you prep the one thing that takes forever, but then three or four teachers end up using it and it becomes something that you use year after year. Um, And it actually leads into the next question that somebody has. They said, we have one minute before. Yeah. Plastic. Like, what do we do? I got, really good rubber maids and um you know my rubber maids are at this point 12 years old um i try to not go with the flimsy plastic but actually spend the money and get the heavy rubber maids and then i take a picture of what's inside laminate it and put it on the outside i don't know if like it's still plastic but it's not as disposable i guess the harder ikea ones not the flimsy flimsy ones the ones a little bit more they've lasted me pretty good except for the lids when you let the kids have access to the lids if you take the lid off and take it away and then give them the thing my ikeas have been going for the last eight years and it's just they're slightly more expensive one and then that's not too bad and it's clear which i really really like i also see somebody said true crime is a big new thing with our i found true crime went a little bit up with all the covid stuff this year it's like i had to do almost an entire card of books about true crime so if you want to, um, if you have any other questions, um, me and Ria, I'm sure will be happy mm-hmm. to uh, email you back. Um, we'll, tr- we'll be able to put in our email address, I believe, in this workshop site, like where you can get uh, links. Um, if Ria, you don't mind, we'll put up um, this presentation because there's some things mm-hmm. at the end that we never got to that you could look Absolutely. through. So please feel free to reach out to us. And I love collaborating over districts and provinces mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sorry it was oh, more directed at you than at us, but it was a short amount of time. <laughs> I know. Amy, if you want to stick around, I can answer your question about the collab um, question. When teachers expect us to do all the planning all the time, um, <laughs> I can 
if you feel like sticking around. Well, for everyone else, I hope you could take at least one thing or at least have one question that you could send back at us that we can try to help you with. And good luck. You're in the right place. Being a tail mm-hmm. is amazing. And have fun on your next workshops. Yes. I guess they're right away, aren't they? I, he Joseph has said that we're supposed to be done at 11.05. We're almost at 11.10. Um, yeah. So it'll be pretty close, I think. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming.